it's my great pleasure to introduce Rafael Santos from our uh, institute from Center for Theoretical Physics. Rafael is doing PhD with Fleming, as far as I know, and uh, he's gonna tell us about the school work about uh, uh, self-testing that originates from uh, some contextuality inequalities and their violations, it seems. Uh, yeah, so uh, please suffer the floor, the screen is, is yours. Okay, as this, this, the title of this presentation is the, the title of this paper we published recently in Quantum. And uh, I prepared the presentation based in this paper. And uh, the title is Sum of Squares, the Compositions for a Family of Non-Contextuality Inequalities. And uh, my presentation has five uh, sections. And uh, first, a brief introduction. I will be straight to the point. What's the purpose of this, this work? Then I will, I will have, I have a section about preliminaries, which is uh, and I will talk about the concepts we, we needed to, to do this work. And uh, in the section three and four, I will present our results in the end, some conclusions. And uh, if you want to stop me in, uh, during the talk, you, you can stop and ask questions and, uh, and that's all. Okay, well, brief, a brief introduction. A brief introduction will be straight uh, to the point. What's the, the purpose of this job? Well, it's a fundamental problem to, to understand what's the maximum information about the underlying quantum system and uh, that can be inferred from correlations observed in a contextuality experiment and whether this information can be used for certifications of quantum devices from minimal assumptions of their internal functioning. This is, in some sense, the purpose of this job. Uh, for example, suppose you have a, a quantum computer and we want to certify that it's working properly. We the maximum we can assess in some system it's applied to some measurements to get the outcomes, perform this experiment many times, collect the statistics, and this is the information we have. And if you want to characterize what's the quantum system behind it, uh, it's, a, it's a problem. And uh, this is the main purpose of self-testing. Well, what we need to talk. I first I will talk this now it's prelim, prelim, in preliminaries. Uh, I'll talk about what's the setup we are uh, we are we are dealing. It's this sequential measurement setup, and uh, it con consists of uh, suppose we have a preparation system, and we have some measurements that can be implemented. Here the measurements have two outcomes, and uh, we can perform two measurements in sequence. And we can do many copies as we want of these preparation devices and perform these measurements. And, uh, and uh, we perform two measurements in sequence. And this measurement device, it has n different settings. And here, n is odd. And uh, we have short cones that we label by plus one and minus one. This is our, our setup. Well. Here we do only two assumptions, two assumptions. And uh, the first one is this measurement device only returns the actual post measurement state. Since we perform the first measurement uh, and we perform the same measurement at the same time, we get with probability one the same outcome. And, uh, and we, but if we perform the an another one and uh, you can do it many times, many times, and in the end, we can collect the statistics of these probabilities, P, uh, with this no notation, A1 is the, the first measurement, the second one, and with these outcomes. And uh, we can compute these average values. And in some sense, we can do the same uh, for only one measurement. And we, we, after this, this, the runs of this experiment, we can we can have these numbers, these expectation values. Well, in quantum theory, uh, a measurement will be represented by this following emission operator. It's in this case, we label the outcomes by plus one and minus one. 
So we can write in this way, two, it's uh, P of M and uh, well, a set of P of M, let's say F I and uh, uh, identity means F I and uh, we have this, this, this expression. And uh, the second assumption is uh, the measurements are realized in a particular way such that k a are emission or equivalently k a it's the root square of f i. This second assumption will be important for the self testing. And uh, these are uh, weaker uh, assumptions than the, the standard assumptions of quotient spec and contextual contextuality. And this is one of the nice things of our work. And well, well, after we perform several runs of this experiment, and when we collect this, that sorry, Rafael, maybe I got I got so. Uh, can you just uh, you mentioned something about non-contextual uh, assumption? I got a bit so. Sorry. Yes, I will talk here exactly in this in okay. the in this in this slide. But well, for example, uh, we have this expression for, for example, when you perform this, this, this experiment many times and collect the statistics, we can compute this expression in, in the equation four. And uh, where C i and the i are some uh, real numbers that you can choose, doesn't, uh, for now, doesn't matter. It's just a linear expression of these expectation values. And uh, before we perform this measurement, we don't assume anything uh, about the distribution, probability distributions that are that arise on, on this uh, on this experiment. And uh, we say that uh, the the classical value here is given by this expression, where uh, we take the maximum overall uh, deterministic strategies that we can assigned to, to, these, to these measurements. And what's behind this is the hypothesis of non-contextuality. And we, we can talk about, uh, I can talk about many things, but it is the mathematical definition of the non-contextuality hypothesis on, on this work. And uh, this explains what you would like, Michal. Uh, yeah, so uh, can you maybe elaborate why, like, for people that are maybe a bit less familiar with contextuality, uh, like, why this would be, uh, like, why uh, non-contextuality assumption enters here? Well, uh, one interpretation, one physical interpretation I like is to think uh, about the, uh, the nature of uh, how probabilities arise in some sense. For example, uh, when we, we have this notion of classicality, uh, we have in some sense a, a notion that we, when performing the measurement, we have the, the, the outcome predetermined. And uh, to perform a measurement, we only reveal something that uh, has a pre-existence. And, uh, and uh, this is one notion of classicality. And, uh, but we can think, let's say, in, in theories that describes physical phenomena by, and the probability arise, let's say, for the absence of knowledge of everything. We just take average of, of, over this. And this is the idea of, uh, try to put in equations some, this kind of interpretation. For example, we, we say that uh, uh, distribution probability has a non-contextual hidden variable model. If it, it has this, there is a, I can, I can write some equations for you after if you want to explain what is a non-contextual hidden variable model. But if distribution probabilities respect this, they, and we try to take the maximum of, of this linear expression in equation four. And uh, it's enough to consider only this, this classical, uh, this uh, deterministic assignment. And uh, I don't know if it is enough for you. Yeah, I mean, I, yeah, I, I, uh, 
sort of, uh, yes, I, I get it, but sort of maybe implicitly you assume here that you don't have state independent contextuality. Is state independent? No, no, it's not a state independent. It's not no, state but what I'm saying is that like you, like if you had like state independent contextuality, then you would have like no way to to have those classical probability this uh, like uh, this classical probability distribution, right? Mm, I didn't understand exactly what you what okay, you... Uh, please. I mean, I'm okay. I'm I'm happy with it. So you sort of you assume, let's say you want to here like assume that all the values of whatever you are measuring values of observables AI plus one AI, they are sort of uh, kind of well defined and you, you have like a like act of measurement doesn't change it, right? Yes, it's one, it's one interpretation, it's one interpretation. Sure, yeah, thanks. Mm -hmm. Okay. And uh, for example, if you want now to, to compute this expression when we have this, the, this, it's given by quantum theory, it's given by this expression six, which we take the supremum over this operator, this quantum operator B, when we, we substitute in this expression, this A, I operators by emission operators acting on a Hilbert space. We do, here we don't assume uh, the dimension. We assume the, the dimension of the Hilbert space is finite. We don't assume any dimension. And uh, we compute over all states, all uh, assignments of these emission operators and compute this average value. And you take the supremum overall, all of this. Uh, we don't know if it, the system is closed. We, don't, we know from non-locality that some of them are non-closed. And then to take the maximum, not always is suitable. And here we just choose the supremum. And uh, well, and this is, uh, and uh, for example, one example, one of the most famous example and of this is the KCBS inequality, which takes the, it's a particular case of the inequality we have in this equation four. And uh, the classical value, it's, let's say we have, uh, a run of this experiment with any measurements. They are, for example, the measurement A1 is measured, can be measured together with A2, A2 with A3, and AN minus one with AN, and AN with A1. And we compute these average values. The classical bound here is N minus two, and the maximum quantum violation of this inequality is given by this expression. This inequality for N uh, equal or uh, larger than five, it's not trivial because this number is actually bigger than n minus two. And, uh, and a particular quantum realization which achieved this optimal quantum realization given, is given by these expressions that I wrote in this, this slide. But instead of just look for these equations, uh, there is this picture that uh, this describes what happens. For example, when we have five measurements, uh, we, the measurements uh, are given this expression 10. Uh, we have uh, this uh, two, uh, one dimensional projector means identity. And if you describe uh, what's these vectors VI and what's the state, we describe completely this, this quantum realization. And uh, it's enough uh, to take only uh, with real coordinates. We don't need to take any complex uh, coordinates like in this equation 11. And uh, this is a description, let's say, of a, a quantum state, a quantum uh, realization, which achieves this, this optimal quantum realization. And in this sense, we say that the quantum theory is a contextual theory because it violates this inequality seven, the inequality seven doesn't hold in this, in this, in this, in this uh, it's violated by, let's say, a quantum system. And um, this is the meaning that when you say that the quantum field is contextual, that well, cannot be explained by a non-contextual hidden variable model. And this is one, one way to, to say this. And uh, well, and uh, with this, uh, another thing I need to talk um, here. Sorry, can I ask? Uh, so you said uh, you introduced this maximal violation. 
so uh, what dimension is suffices to get this maximal violation? What well, can you repeat? What dimension suffices to get this? Ah, in this, this, in this uh, inequality, the, the KCBS, it's in for any odd, it's in dimension three. We can get the maximum violation. Mm -hmm. Or n even, it's in dimension four. Mm -hmm. I and see. Let's see. For example, for n equals to four, uh, this, the inequality is violated. The classical bound is different here, but for example, it corresponds to uh, the Bell scenario. So in dimension four, we can get the maximum. And but for when n is odd, uh, uh, the dimension three, it's enough to get the okay. maximum. Thanks. Mm -hmm. And this is one of the reasons we, in this, 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 this family of inequalities we are working, we work on with pod dimensions because it's even dimensions, the behavior is completely different. Mm -hmm. And uh, this is CBS, okay. Okay, uh, one of the techniques we use it here is based on the sum of squares decomposition. Uh, for example, in these self-testing schemes that uh, are based on non-locality and uh, contextuality, uh, they exploit the maximum violation of some inequalities. If we have the maximum violation, this can be checked uh, in a same device independent way, let's say doing some assumptions about the system you have, and we need to exploit the maximum violation of this. One strategy to use is the sum of squares, the composition, and for example, we have this quantum look, looking for this uh, equation 14. We have this B operator, this quantum operator. If we have this shift, let's say eta identity minus B written as a sum of squares, let's say you can represent in this way, we can conclude that N eta is a, it's a, it's, it's a upper bound to the quantum bound of the, the inequality associated for any quantum state. And uh, if this bound is uh, achieved in an experiment, it means that these squares must be saturated. And if we, then we have some algebraic relations and these are the, algebra, uh, the unique relations we, we, we have to to, to, to exploit uh, what's the quantum system that we appear here. And uh, let's see. And uh, in order to find the sum of squares, I think it's, it's maybe one of the hardest steps of this, this, this work. Uh, it was necessary to modify this KCBS inequality. We wanted to, to, to do the self-testing of this same uh, optimal quantum violation of the KCBS inequality. But now we needed to, to modify it to, to find a sum of squares because we couldn't find it with this standard inequality. And in order to do it, for example, I will show you here the simplest case. It's when we have n uh, uh, five measurements uh, that can be performed. It's in this equation 16. This is the linear expression, expression the inequality we, we are, we are handled. The, the difference from the KCBS is that we add this term uh, alpha square with the, the expectation values of the single measurement. And when we did it, and we, we could, could find the sum of squares. It's a, and then, for example, uh, the maximum quantum value uh, when alpha is half of second uh, of pi over n, we have this quantum bound given by three times one plus alpha square. This is uh, the maximum bound and uh, this inequality is, is trivial. It means that the, the class bound it's, it's lower. And uh, I will show you the, how you give you just an idea of the proof of this, how we did it. And for example, uh, if you now we take this, the, the quantum operator, we have an expression like this in H in, and uh, we needed to find the sum of squares. In order to find it, 
we define it this following emission operators MI1 and MI2. And I going Let's through try one to five. Something uh, here. Mm. Um, like you have this anti commutator here, I see. And okay, it's okay. I've got a question somehow about this because, like, if you do quantum mechanical experiments, right, and uh, observable, how is it? It's not okay. Maybe I'm like, wait, wait. So, so uh, when you do like sequential measurement, right? So, do you then get the pro like? Such an anti commutator of of uh, of those operators AI, or uh, they appear in just specific order. I'm I'm confused about this. Well, this this is based in in one of the uh, one of the assumptions we did. For example, when we have the 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 maximum quantum violation, uh, we have the commutation of these operators in sequence. Let's say only in the state. You don't assume the uh, the non-commutation of the operators in for every state. You don't assume. Wait, but I'm not asking. Wait, wait. I'm I'm just asking. Like I'm not asking for maximal violation, but mm -hmm. like in general, right? If you perform this measurement, right? What would be the form of this? If you really, like, if you assume quantum mechanics, if you assume a state collapse, right? Uh, and you don't assume that, that they commute or not commute, mm -hmm. what is the form of the corresponding uh, operator B? Because like, like, yeah, uh, it's not clear for me why would it be anti-commutator? Uh, yeah. Ah, okay. Because the expression we consider it, look, it's this 16. Yeah. We put A1, A1 plus ah, 1. Ah, you have the symmetric product. Of, okay. Yes, and A1. Ah, okay, this is what I overlooked. Yes, AI plus one AI. We so it corresponds to two different experiments, actually. Yes, yes, I, yes. I mean, sort of yeah, you combine like two ways of doing similar experiments. You change the order. Yeah. I like you do clockwise or counterclockwise. Yes, we change the order. We change the order, and and uh, for example, it's. You see the end. For example, from the maximum violation, how this anti commutation appears. This is one thing that, for example, in the standard context, in Cushing's packet contextuality, they assume the commutation uh, relations of the measurements. In this case, here we don't assume. This is the reason we put uh, this different order of the measurements. Mm -hmm. And well, and when now we have this quantum operator in this equation 18, what we want is to find the sum of squares. We need to find uh, the a proper sum of squares. And with this, I just show to you uh, briefly um, uh, this, for example, we, we needed to define here 10 operators that we define on these 11 and 20 equations, which are linear combinations of AI. This first, this, let's say this in this one, it means that we take the neighbors of these measurements, A plus one, A minus one. When we have this, this sub indice two, we have we take a plus two a, a a minus two, and we take linear combinations of these, and we choose we choose some convenient uh, coefficients, and uh, and thinking on these coefficients are chosen previously, and uh, we can do it, and uh, with this choice we have for example this. Uh, equations 21 and 22 they hold. When you take the this convenient linear combinations of MI1 and MI2, and you take the sum over i, and this linear combination of this MI square one, MI1 square, MI2 square, over, is sum over i, and we have these two equations. And uh, if now we take this expression 23, it's a linear combinations of the last expressions had in the previous in the previous uh, in, the, in the previous equations. We have exactly a sum of squares of this operator. These terms in the first line 
they, they are squares. Look, these operators are Hermitian. And then we have the square, they are proper sum of squares. And this coefficient which appear here, it's exactly, it's tight. It's exactly the maximum violation of the, the, the non-contextuality inequality. And it shows that uh, uh, it's upper bound, upper bound and the same uh, quantum, uh, quantum state measurements that we talked before, they, they, they achieve this maximum. It means that uh, it's not upper bound, it's tight. And this is the maximum quantum violation of this, this inequality. And now if you want more measurements, uh, we got it to, to the same, the same, let's say, uh, the same, uh, the same setup, but now with more measurements. Uh, for example, now if you have this power of two plus one and m uh, larger or equal to two, and we have, let's say, this the linear expression to be considered in 24. It's quite similar to, to the previous one, but now we, we can have more measurements. We got a uh, sum of squares in a, in a quite similar way. And uh, we found these, these operators, m, i, key, and uh, where i goes to 1 to n, and key to, from 1 to n, n minus 1 over 2. And these coefficients bk and alpha are given by these expressions at 26 and 27. And uh, if you want, for example, that they stabilize, uh, this is the unique linear combination we can take of these operators in a such way that if we do the same we did before, uh, for example, we will have- uh, Rafael, can you, like, you called those operators stabilizers? Yes, I why, left. Why they are called stabilizers? Do they have? Does it have anything to do with the stabilizers in quantum computing? Yes, it's a good question. I left in this in quotation marks because if I say stabilizers, they stabilize some state. Let's say when I apply the operators, it in the state it returns the state. It's a, but in this case, and uh, these, these measurements, uh, or let's say these operators AI, AI plus K, AI minus K, they, they can be any operator in any Hilbert space, finite dimensional. And uh, this, it, this cannot be stabilized. But when, for the, when we uh, look for what are the, these linear combinations we should choose, we look at we well we found it looking for stabilizers of the of the the the, the quantum the quantum let's say the quantum state and measurements the quantum realization that we desire to self test and because when we have the the, the correct choice of these measurements all of these operators they stabilize the state. If you back, we, we back in this, for example, here, this equation 15, and we have something like a k when the psi should be zero, but we can shift, let's say, plus identity. We can add or and subtract identity here and uh, to be, uh, let's say, a stabilizer or uh, operator that uh, it's, it's, the problem is, is the same in some, in some sense. Mm -hmm. But uh, okay, well. I ask you, yeah, uh, so thanks for clarification. But like it all looks a bit intricate. How do you find those coefficients? And why do you choose those particular linear combinations? Yes, well, because in, because we want these operators. Look at this uh, sum of squares. Mm -hmm. uh, let's say the previous one, it, it, it's enough. For example, this equation 23. We have this, this sum identity. It's here is identity minus, let's say, mi uh, and uh, one square. We have these squares. If they stabilize, so then identity, this expression, it should stabilize the state. The, well, when I apply the state, it's zero. It means that mi one is a stabilizer of the state. No, I understand. I understand. Yeah. 
Yes. No, so what? No, this part I I, I got, but like uh, this construction, right? Like, why do you have those particular coefficients? Is it mm -hmm. like you guys wanted to get to get the sum of squares somehow? You tried, you failed, and like it happened to work, and you are happy, or is there some systematic way to look for those coefficients? Yes, uh, in the end, I think the answer of this question goes in direction of the choice of the inequality we we need to we need to use for self testing. It's not any inequality that will be useful for self testing. For example, in this equation 24, we have we have this in this equation 24, we have we have uh, let's say the freedom to choose uh, what's gamma. We have the choosing to choose what's gamma. And in some sense, this gamma, the freedom to choose this gamma, is intricated with the freedom to choose these coefficients. We can choose these coefficients previously to self-test some desired uh, quantum quantum realization. This we think we have the inequality, but it can be any inequality, linear inequality we want. We choose entity conveniently. To, to everything holds. We think, uh, well, we have this quantum state. We want to self-test it, What, how to do it. And for example, this we did for this end cycle, but uh, the same approach maybe you can work for others, others quantum realization house. But to do it, we need to, to pay attention in what, uh, in what scenario we, 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 are, we are interested. And well, it, this, these equations are, I think it, this, the main ideas are the same in this, this, this simplest case, but we have now more measurements. The sum of squares is more complicated and uh, it was maybe the hardest, one of the hardest problems of this, this work that uh, this is the, the sum of squares we have for more measurements in the general case. Well, in this family at least, two power m plus one and uh, this is the, the structure of the sum of squares. And uh, we have a lot of coefficients. Uh, if are, it's, there are some technical details I can tell you but if you want, but uh, the, the main idea is the same from the simplest case. We just take, uh, we want a sum of squares which deem it to be of this form, of this first line of this equation. And with, it, with the choice of the, Stabilized before. We open this, this calculation and we have expression like this. We, if you want a sum of squares, we need these terms to vanish. And we need to choose these coefficients CK and D to be positive. Otherwise, this will not be a sum of squares. And if you want all of these to, to, to hold in some sense, uh, we cannot do it with any number of measurements, only with this, this family. Two power m plus one, and uh, and well, it it gave us some work to to I don't know if we, it's necessary to explain all these coefficients, but the idea is this: uh, when we have uh, we want to choose this coefficient c k to be non-negative and these anti-commutators to vanish except for k plus one minus one, and uh, well, these are the expressions we want uh, we we had. And uh, a suitable choice for these coefficients are these, given these equations 31 and 32. And, and, uh, for, and then just to simplify, we have this sum of squares, where this quantum operator is given by this expression, uh, the gamma, it's the, of the non-contextuality inequality it's given here. And this eta is the, the quantum the optimal quantum value of this inequality. And uh, when well, then we have this expression. Let's uh, I just write it again to talk about these results. Well, the maximum quantum value of this modified inequality uh, is this eta. We gave him this uh, the last expression. And uh, the classical value is given by n plus eta minus two. And this is just a little tricky how to find it, but it's 
it's not it's not hard and we should this inequality is not trivial and uh, we have this maximum value and this maximum value it's attained by this the, the desired quantum quantum system we 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 wanted let's see so just my question is like to what like what is this desired uh, that you said uh, desired quantum system or desired quantum realization is exactly what I represent this. Okay, but, and for higher n, it's a generalization of this. No, uh, because it's not in the higher dimension, it's for more measurements. This representation. That's it, why I said but, higher n, higher n. Yes, higher n, okay. So higher n means more, more, like more vertices. Yes, right? yes, yes. Yes. And so this is the realization you want to mm -hmm. test, right? Yeah. Yes. Okay. In dimension and in dimension three. All of them in dimension three. Well, so my question is like uh, in Berlin locality, I, I know what self-testing loosely speaking means, okay? Mm -hmm. But like here in the contextuality, in the context of contextuality. Uh, like, what does it mean that you self-test? Like, you like you don't assume the dimension, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. So, uh, what properties you can actually self-test? Like, what freedom do you have? Yeah. Yes. Let me show you the next slide. Yes, this. Ah, okay. Is a, this is the definition of the self-test in this contextual scenario. For example, we want what we want to self-test. Let's say a preparation. Psi bar, which belongs to a, a Hilbert space of dimension D, and a set of measurements AI bar, uh, I1 from 1 to N, let's say acting on CD, are defined as follows. If a set of observables acting this on no uh, finite dimensional Hilbert space and a state maximally violate this inequality, then exists a uh, isometry from this Hilbert space to CD, such that uh, this isometry will bring the state from the desired state, let's say, and the, all the measurements for the, for, for the realization that we want to, to self-test. This is the definition here. And uh, just to present our last result is that uh, this inequality, this family of inequalities that we derived, they actually self-test the this this system, and uh, for example, now we just need to modify a little bit the the sum of squares we had in order to to understand why one of the assumptions we did in the beginning they are necessary, and uh, well, we have this. Let's say we just add this term; it's non-positive. And we, the sum of squares just to add this with the square operators of the measurements, where beta n, beta tilde is this, this expression. And now we can just talk about this result. This is a, well, this is the result we, we had uh, under the assumptions one and two. If a quantity state and, uh, and a set of measurements violate this, the inequality, and uh, we, we wrote then exist a projection to this Hilbert space to dimension to his Hilbert space in dimension three and a unitary acting on C3 such that this unitary brings the state where well, we can choose one basis to give the state one zero zero and the measurements will be given by this expression here, this equation for one. And um, the idea of the proof it's 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 not a it's a long proof and I just will give some ideas of how we did it and uh, well we when we have the we, we perform the measurement when we have the the maximum quantum violation what we have is the the saturation of this the sum of squares it implies that m i k acting on psi is psi Particular case when k is equal to one, we will imply in this equation from, from the sum of squares. 
And uh, just to clarify why this equation 43, 44, and 45, just go back. Uh, just go back here, for example, here. No, no, no. Here, it's enough. In this equation 33, uh, we have this, uh, the saturation of these, these terms. And the saturation of these terms imply in these algebraic relations in these three equations. And only if these three rela relations, we got the self-testing statement. Only with these three, it's enough to say that uh, there exists a, a, a invariant subspace in dimension three. Uh, and uh, in this invariant subspace of, of dimension three, it's enough uh, to, to get only to get this maximum violation and the maximum violation it's up to a unitary uh, associated to this uh, to the desired quantum realization you wanted to self test. Um, sorry, in the previous slide, uh, slide to, uh, there were those operators F. Like what are those? Maybe I missed them. This A. F. X, F? F. F, it's, it's defined in the beginning. This operator F, it's the, the product of the Krauss operators of the measurements. We can, we can okay. have AI. AI is true, F means. Ah, okay, A. yes, thanks. Mm -hmm. And uh, well, with this, well, with these three equations, we have this theorem. And this theorem, we prove it. Well, it says that if you have these three relations, let's say, let's find these three relations, it's satisfied. Then there exists a projection to this Hilbert space to C3 and uh, a unitary act on all C3 such that 4 to 1 holds true. It's 4 to 1 is the, this, this expression. And uh, to prove it, it's a long proof. We did it in two steps. First, we prove that there is a three-dimensional invariant subspace, and uh, just briefly to talk about it, to talk about it, let's say, uh, for example, when we have this, uh, this, this, we, we want to construct this proof. The unique mathematical objects we have is the state and some measurements, and some operators a one and two a n. But if you take the the linear span of psi. A1 psi and A3 psi, we creating this, this, this subspace and uh, the algebra of this, the other operators of this space is invariant. It means that if you act with another operator, it belongs to the same subspace. And one of the consequences is that uh, this operator AI, this, in this equation for seven, if this operator AI, we don't know the dimension it acts, but uh, with this lemma, we can show that there exists a block structure that uh, AI children is acting on this three-dimensional subspace. And uh, this allow us to define uh, this, let's say, operators children in this three-dimensional subspace. And, uh, and with this, we, we, we proved this. Uh, we needed, let's say, to show what's the, the, the trace of these operators F, they are equals to one. This is one of the parts of, the, of this another lemma. It has, the, uh, let's say trace one, it's, it means the dimension of the image, image of these projectors is one. And uh, all these operators in this three dimensional space, it's given this equation 52. And, uh, and to characterize the measurements now, we just need to characterize these, these vectors vi. And uh, we did it by construction with the, the same equations we have in the beginning of the saturation of the sum of squares, we could recover the, the quantum realization we wanted. And uh, this is another, the, the last part of this proof. For example, one equation that comes from the saturation of the sum of squares is the equation 53. 
And there are some symmetries just to simplify the explanation. And we have freedom to choose, uh, let's say, one year, some unit hours. And uh, in the end, we we well we could recover uh, we could recover exactly the 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 vectors that uh, they classify this this quantum realization we wanted and uh, it, and show that they are unitarily equivalent this this completes the proof just if you want more details this proof is technical but uh, i think the main message is to to, to understand the concept of self testing and to have some ideas of how we did it. And, uh, and that's now some conclusions. Well, what we did is to derive some self-testing statements for the N-cycle scenario using weaker assumptions than the, the made previous in quotient specker. Uh, something we did was uh, to use the uh, a sum of squares technique. It's the first time it was used the, the sum of squares for contextuality. It was previously used on non-locality. And now we could show that it works also. E, and well, something we should remark is not full device independent. We needed to do these assumptions. And uh, this is the best we, 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 we got. It was to do this, this first assumptions in the beginning. Uh, but to, for example, one nice thing compared to non-locality is that here we don't require space-like separation. And uh, this is something that can be done in just one place. And, and uh, let's say it's probably, probably we can use the same approach for other quantum realizations. Uh, and uh, well, other thing that we didn't do, it's about the robustness, it's which suitable for experimental uh, implementations. And we don't have the robustness, maybe it's one work to be done in the future. We don't have idea of how to do it properly. And uh, let's say, and another possibility of future work is, uh, Unifying approach to self-testing based in both, let's say, on locality and contextuality. And, uh, and I think, well, that's all. This what I prepared. And that's all. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Rafael, for, for a very nice talk. Thanks. Uh, yeah, we have time for questions, comments. Uh, please, guys, don't hesitate to ask questions. Um, so the idea, the idea, is, let me see if I understand the, the, the idea of the self-testing and contextuality. So it would be to, to say how much quantness you have in your system or what are you uh, exactly, let me see if I can put it better. It's one way. It's one way of thinking. Yeah, it's how far away are you from uh, classical? Yes, yes. It's it's one way to to think about uh, how because, for example, uh, we don't have another physical theory which which cannot violate, uh, let's say, uh, well, let's say a physical theory which bring give us probabilities for some events happens in nature. And uh, we don't have any other theory, physical theory, which is, which is, let's say, you violate uh, non-contextuality inequalities. Then, in some sense, if you, we have this violation, in some sense, you are saying that well, it's quantum, and uh, and uh, with this also, this work, let's say, the maximum of quantum quantumness, let's say, it's it's suitable. To, to think in the interpretation like this. This is the maximum that we can with some inequalities by quantum theory. Mm. But uh, in principle, you can have theories which uh, like exceed those inequalities for the quantum values, right? Uh, you repeat, please? No, I mean that in principle, like you can have some more general 
probabilistic theories that yeah. like exceed this quantum value, right? So you are interested in this regime between classical and the maximal quantum. This is the case, yes? Yes. Uh, yes. So you basically have some inequalities which follow from the quantum formalism and uh, check if they exceed what would follow if you assumed the uh, contextuality so or the classicity right yes. The, to yes something like this okay cool yes we can have other physical theories which can but uh, well i don't know well i think in general just like in non-locality people consider it like you know you can have like non-signaling theory right yeah and there, i mean i'm not sure how interest is, interesting is it for some people but okay i guess it's interesting for some people they uh, like it's it's conceivable that something like this would yes. exist, although <laughs> whether or not it's physics or just sort of <laughs> yeah sure mind I games know. it's it's not up to us to yes uh, for example if well you... i mean unless you get something like this in experiments right <laughs> Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. When we have uh, this equation, for example, this equation two, here we have uh, this. This is, let's say, it makes sense in physical theory. It should. Uh, it should be. We should be able to to compute, for example, this expectation value for just one measurement, independently of what measurement was performed together. For example, yeah. in this Bell scenario. It uh, it uh, it means that if you, this, for example, this probability can be computed, and this will preclude with this non-signaling condition in contextuality. It's not the non-disturbance uh, condition, and there are some people looking for kinds of fields that can be more and more, but respecting this this principle. Here in contextuality, it's the non-disturbance. When you go to non-locality this because contextual can be seen as a more general framework and so uh, so this non-disturbance means that uh, what does it mean it, it it has meaning that any physical theory let's say it should respect some principles and uh, and uh, should respect what case, oh. for example suppose for example suppose you let's say you have three measurements a one a2, A3. You can perform A2 together with A1 and A3. And then you can compute this joint probability of these two measurements with two outcomes. Mm -hmm. Now the question is, what's the probability, let's say, of one outcome when you perform the measurement two? Mm -hmm. What you take, let's say, the, the sum over together with A1 or A3? Mm -hmm. And uh, if it depends, let's say, of the, or let's say, of the context of the other measurement you are doing together, it's something, let's say, strange. This principle must, uh, let's say, be reasonable for any physical theory that we can describe something, let's say, scientifically. Mm, okay. <laughs> That's uh... no, so just to put it in a different way. So like, so, so it's like, imagine you do sequence, like you have sequential measurement unit, right? Uh -huh. And then, uh, I guess what I was just referring to was like the situation you can measure some observable after measuring first one observable or another one. Mm -hmm. And then the, the marginal distribution that doesn't depend on uh, like what comes earlier. Yes. Okay, okay. And in quantum mechanics, if observables don't commute, you do have this disturbance, right? Of the yes, yes, right? yes. Let yes. me just comment like you said, okay, that, I uh, get it. That uh, quantum mechanics, I mean, I, I think it's sort of true what you said, like, okay, like we don't have full fledged physical theory that uh, like explains such uh, well, violation of such inequalities and like that. Come, that can be attributed to contextuality. But if we are, let's say, if you are asking questions not about like fundamental constituencies of nature, but we are more relaxed, like if we do sociology or psychology. So it's actually a known fact. And I guess people, like some people use this formalism, uh, 
like formalism that people do is similar to, to what you have in the context of contextuality. So like, you know, you have some statistical surveys and basically uh, you can very easily modify like typical behavior of, of your samples, like basing on the way you phrase questions, for example, or like uh, whether or not the, the people that you query, whether or not they had lunch uh, earlier or not, stuff like this, right? So <laughs> mm -hmm. like, in, 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 okay, this is just some side. Okay. Yes, well, but right. people like, I, the point is I, people do use <laughs> like uh, this kind of tools for uh, uh, to establish like whether the data was, I don't know, biased in some way or not, you know, just to. Yes, yes. I saw once article about like some paper which was uh, showing that there is some entanglement uh, in the uh, usage of some words <laughs> together or something like this. Okay. Like, yes. So it was fun, but uh, it was also wrong. So, <laughs> right, right. Uh, uh, okay, I have one technical question. So, like you said, like, not so like before your work there were no other tests like there were no other self-testing results that that were based on contextuality no there are there are there were i think i know two papers so from self-testing from contextuality and uh, one one paper it's a uh, they it's from people from singapore they they let's say they self-tested the same the same consistent the, 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 the end cycle they did the same but they they didn't they did more strong assumptions and uh, and uh, they used a completely different technique they used some techniques from sdp and uh, and what we did here is to do something uh, uh, looking this sum of squares completely analytical and uh, what they did there is with SDP mm -hmm. and stronger assumptions. Well, our assumptions are weaker. So what were their assumptions? These assumptions one, these, these assumptions, the measurement device returned the actual post measurement and the second one in the end. So this is what they assume, they assume this? Or... No, we, we assume. So they what, assume, they, what they extra stuff the, they assume? The, the commutation relations uh -huh. and uh, oh. projectivity and what projectivity uh-huh okay so there are quite kind of strong assumptions i agree yes yes uh-huh so kind of okay one more technical question so in the, when you were showing the sum of squares the composition like one of the terms was sort of cert the way i see it was certifying projectivity right yes Yes. Was it like you wanted probably this kind of sum of square decompositions to be able to self test? The this, second one, right? This one, one, the last one? The last the one, last one, one sorry. Yeah. Because when it's the PO VM, this operator, this identity means this, it's same definite positive. It's project, it's a project projective, these things vanish. Mm -hmm. yeah, 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 I understand. But this is, we didn't assume. Projectivity. Sure, sure, sure. But like when you were constructing the sum of squares decomposition, you wanted to have probably such a term, right? In, oh. e, well, you yes. Wanted to like enforce this projectivity from your sum of squares. Yes, yes. From the maximum violation. Yeah. From okay. The uh huh. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah. Cool. Uh, nice. Okay. Any any more questions to Rafael? Okay, if not, let us uh, thank him again for his time and nice presentation. Thanks, Safel.